Yeah, I believe it's chapter seven. Right? All right. You have to bear with me. I'm fighting a cold, so I'm a little frazzled. Uh, <laughs> That's no fun. Well, I've been fighting it pretty much all winter, but it's now starting to win. <laughs> <laughs> Just as the cold weather gets here, too. At least it's at the cold. Yeah. Yeah. So the three major sub-assemblies of the outboard marine engine are the C power head lower unit and intermediate housing. Yep. The assembly of the upward engine that provides the means for attaching the engine to the boat is the intermediate housing. Excuse me. The subassembly of the upward engine that operates under the water is the D lower unit. For the assembly of the outboard engine that usually contains the transmission for forward and reverse thrust, as well as the neutral gear, is the lower unit. The two basic configurations for outboard engines are two cycle and four cycle. The crankcase design for outboard engines differs from the inboard engine in that the outboard crankcase operates in a vertical mode. Yeah. Seven, a two cycle outboard will generally have more D power per pound of weight than a four stroke outboard. Two cycle outboard engine D has exhaust ports in the cylinder walls. Yep. The purpose of the carburetor used with the outboard engine is to provide correct fuel air mixture. Yep. Carburetors used on outboard engines are generally of the single a single barrel design. Eleven fuel used in two cycle gasoline outboards must be mixed with oil D. The three basic ignition systems currently in use for outboard engines are C, solid state, magneto, and distributor slash breaker plane. Lubrication for four cycle outboard engines requires, I feel like this was a trick question. I put B, but was wondering if it was A. I Yeah, B is correct. The funny thing is, I have the wrong answer <laughs> just circled in my book. <laughs> I've been using this book for 10 years. <laughs> 14. In an outboard mechanical shifting transmission, the engagement between the clutch and forward reverse gear results in D sudden shock or impact loads in the transmission. The major difference between outboard engine drive systems and inboard outboard stern drives is that the stern drive C are permanently attached to an opening in the transmission. Okay, the two factors that affect the trim of a boat powered by an outboard engine are uh, the loading of a boat and the tilt of the upward motor. As a minimum, stern drives and the lower unit of outboard engines should be checked and serviced um, D twice during the loading season. 18. Sacrificial zinc anodes should be replaced when 50% consumed. A. What steps should be taken if moisture or contaminants are found in the lubricant of the lower unit or stern drive? A, find the cause, make repairs, and replace the lubricant. Yeah. Place the bolt for sale. Okay. <laughs> sell to Mark. <laughs> or top dog. <laughs> All right, last week we left off. Basically, at the Ninety-two. Yeah. Uh, all right. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, tra the 
transmission in an outboard or stern drive. Um, and the figure 68 on page 92 is what I'm looking at. I don't, unfortunately, I don't have a uh, any props to show you on this one, so I have to kind of explain it from the diagram. But the the, the they show the drive shaft that's coming down from the top, which is attached. That's basically attached to the engine output, so that will be spinning at engine RPM. Now, if you look, that meshes with two gears forward and reverse gears you know it's being driven by opposite sides of that gear they're going to be rotating in opposite directions so um, then what they show if they show they call a shifter clutch or you may have heard it in the old days they called it a clutch dog what that is that um, that clutch has a set of the both ends of that clutch piece have teeth in them, almost like your fingers like this. They, and the gears have a matching set of teeth. So they basically slide that, that clutch dog slides front and rear and it's moved by the shift rod, which actually goes in through the, that shaft is hollow at the end so that it can, and that can slide that clutch, that shifter clutch forward and back. So if they're sliding it, like in this diagram, if you're sliding it to the right, it's the teeth in the clutch dog are gonna lock with the teeth in reverse gear. And the inside of that clutch is splined to your propeller shaft. So by engaging it to reverse gear, it's going to start spinning, let's say counterclockwise, just for the sake of description. Um, and because it's splined to the prop shaft, it's going to spin the prop shaft counterclockwise. Now to go into forward gear, you will slide it the other way. It will, again, the teeth will inter interlock with forward gear, but because that's been spinning the opposite direction, it's going to spin the prop shaft clockwise. Oh, okay. So at the end of the drive shaft, that gear, that's always that's, meshed with the yes, forward that's and always, reverse gear. Yes. It's exactly. just a question of which of those which is of those gears is in is to the drive is, shaft. Yeah, in connected gear. to the drive okay. drive shaft. <clears throat> okay. And it's done by sliding that gear back and forth. So that gear has has fingers on it both is, ends. Yes, there's fingers on both ends. To go into either. Okay. On splines on the shaft. Okay. Is so, that what they have labeled as the pinion gear? Looks like it's that. Oh, or is um, that something different? No, the pinion gear is actually the gear that's on the drive shaft. Oh, at the end of the drive shaft. It's a okay. little, it is actually a little, it doesn't look at from the arrow. Yeah. But the pinion gear is the one on the end of the drive shaft. Ah, okay. Um, so that grinding when you go between <clears throat> forward and reverse in an outboard engine is actually it's the shifter those clutch teeth is what we engage is what's, and, you know, getting beat on. Yeah, and it, basically you want to, when you're shifting an outboard, uh, you want to do it on a quick, firm shift because right. you tend to get the grinding if you go slow because right. the teeth start, they skip off each other. Mm -hmm. um, and on the older outboards, that was very, you know, those clutch dogs wearing out were very common. Mm -hmm. You know, back, back in the days when things were designed to be repaired, they used to intentionally make that clutch dog out of a softer material so that that would take the wear versus the gears themselves. Because it was a lot cheaper to change that clutch dog than to have to replace forward or reverse gear. Yeah, I guess. What is a clutch torque limiter? That's sort of uh, the upper upper right hand corner. Of that. Um, basically, it's a bonded rubber sleeve that, at a certain point, it will slip. Hmm. Um, 
basically that's it's interesting they I don't know they call it a torque limiter it's to me its main purpose is if you from my experience is if you run aground and you hit something mm -hmm. to absorb the shock impact uh, but the also the other thing it does is it helps absorb when those gears engage there is that's where they talk about um, engagement between forward and reverse gears is sudden shock loads. Mm -hmm. And that's that when those gears lock in. Mm -hmm. Now those gears also have usually are, have a slight angle to them so that when they catch, the, the shock will tend to pull them together. In other words, they're not perfectly square. They have slight angles so that they'll be less apt to skip off each other and get pulled in. So it's a little bit forgiving if you go from forward to reverse really too quickly. Um, will it? Uh, yeah, the only thing you got to be careful of is that because these are, um, because they said they are not a square, I'm showing you my fingers is like a square engagement, they're not, they're tapered, so that if you've ever noticed, if you're in gear, um, you can actually overpower in what, in you can almost freewheel the propeller. Well, actually, freewheel's not a good word because, um, but you can actually force those gears apart by turning the propeller faster than it wants to go. Um, so you, anyway, you got to be you. You really got to be careful about being too quick going from forward to reverse because the propeller is still spinning forward and you hit reverse. Um, it's going to shorten the life of that clutch assembly. The other thing I couldn't figure out is how does the exhaust get down to the exhaust port on the um, exhaust passage there? If you look, you can kind of see it here, but this um, center housing, I don't see them, I don't see it labeled as right. such. Is that where it said needle uh, bearing? It's the piece that has the needle bearings are in it. The shaft goes through it, but that has there's like three, it's supported in three places, and then it's hollow in between, so that the exhaust can come out around the, the propeller shaft is encased inside that, and there's passages in that piece that line up with the hollow prop. Um, now, the, uh, the other thing that, to be, and this is particularly true on stern drives, that because those teeth on that clutch dog are tapered, they kind of lock themselves in. When you want to pull it out of gear, if it's if the engine is if the propeller is under load, they're not going to want to come out. It's not going to want to come out of gear. Two-stroke engines tend to be. Um, they don't seem two-stroke engines. They don't seem to be as much of an issue because they don't have quite as consistent of. Um, they're not as basically not as smooth running, so that the natural. Natural. Um, and I'm going to say roughness for lack of a better term. Um, tends isn't there's enough erratic to the power to let those gears come apart. But if you have like an, you know, an eight cylinder four stroke engine in a stern drive, or for that matter, it's probably the case on the big outboards, I don't really know. But if you've got a multi-cylinder engine that's a lot, it's smooth, um, they actually have a shift interrupter that just for a fraction of a second kills the ignition to allow that, to allow the Break and load for those gears to slide apart. Mm -hmm. um, and like Mercruiser for years, I'm sure nowadays it's done electronically, but up until very recently, literally there was a little micro switch in the shift linkage that when you pulled the link it, when you pulled the shifter out of gear, it would actually the the load on the shifter mm -hmm. would actuate a little micro switch that would split second kill the ignition. 
and which is hence the reason anybody would say the older stern drives when things start to get a little worn they tend to stall when you try to shift and that that's why because you're actually momentarily killing the ignition and if everything else isn't at a hundred percent it may not recover and they stall so i read somewhere that nowadays it, i think it's like the biggest of the mercury outboards like the Verado, like 400s, 600s, they actually have a two-speed transmission like built into the motor. Would that be in this lower unit as well? Um, you're actually, I have no idea. Okay. To be honest, I'm okay. not familiar with, yeah. with that. I'd never heard of it in an outboard. Um, but that and that whole that whole mechanical clutch drive system has been it's been relatively reliable and they've been used been used for years mm -hmm. uh, back in the early 70s or actually i'm not exactly sure when somewhere around there uh, omc came up with the right idea the, the to alleviate <coughs> The one issue with this clutching set with these mechanical clutch dogs is that that thump, the clunk, or grinding as you find if you don't move the shift fast enough. So again, back I recall it being in the early 70s, OMC came out with their with an electric lower unit. They called it Selectric Shifting, which they show a picture of um, figure 69 on the opposite page. Very similar idea. You've still got the pinion gear coming down from the engine, forward and reverse gears spinning in opposite directions. But instead of having a mechanical clutch dog, they have electric windings on both gears. Those um, pointing at four and five are actually a set of, of windings, electric windings. And basically what they do is it's an electromagnetic clutch. So when you energize that winding, it actually it magnetically latches the gear to the, to the propeller shaft. So now you don't have that mechanical load, that shock load, because it's a, mu it's a much more gradual engagement. And I know I had one. I had an old OMC stern drive that was an electric shift. You talk to any mechanic that was working on those, and they'll tell you what a complete nightmare that turned out to be. I mean, it, it, I can't understand it. You take electricity, put it in salt water, and why? I don't know why you have a problem. <laughs> but, um, because, you know, lower unit seals would go bad. Um, and so those, would, and those were designed as a default... Uh, if it, when they if the system failed, they would default to reverse gear. <laughs> Why I don't know, but I remember as a kid it was not uncommon to see one of those see people coming back backwards back up the river, <laughs> you know, because that was the only gear they had. Um, so it's this whole unit here immersed in oil. Yes. Yeah, and you know, in a perfect world, mm -hmm. there's no seals leaking. If they were done by the French. I mean, it seems like a good idea. And I will say, at the time when I owned it, um, I was like, I don't know what everybody's, why everybody curses these things. I loved it. It was smooth. I mean, shifting was, it was a switch. It was an electric switch. It was like with your pinky, you shift gears. It was, it, from an operator standpoint, it was much nicer than the traditional system. Um, and I had, you know, I had that boat for years. Never had a problem with it until I sold it, and I sold it to a friend of mine who had nothing but problems with it from literally about a month after he got it from me. And you heard all about it. Never sell yeah, anything to a friend. Yeah, actually, he is. Why don't? Any well, I just got saddled with fixing it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't? Maybe not an outboard, but. It, why in an inboard boat do they not use the same type of gearing transmission that they would use in a car where you would start off 
with a low ratio so that the engine could work its way up to a certain RPM and then, you know, the and then sh shift it into another one. It seems like you could get a lot more out of a diesel engine because um, um, you could keep the RPMs down, but you yeah. be... Well, probably the most sensible thing there would be a variable pitch, variable pitch prop like they use in aviation. But I think the reason is because you're driving through a fluid medium. In an automobile, there's no slippage. You, you really can't start out in top gear. Whereas in a boat, you can. If you know you, you put it in gear and the boat kind of works its way up to match the speed to the point where you're moving yeah, at the speed. Why not have the two power. to one and then a one to one? Because then you could decrease your your our, you know, you could get the more uh, revolutions once the boat's moving mm -hmm. with, say, a diesel engine. Instead, you, it would greatly increase your fuel capacity and, and <laughs> you know, decrease the amount of fuel you have to use. And to I missed last week, but from the week before, wouldn't that just create gravitation? There's a lot, that would be loss of power. Yeah, well, there's a limit to how fast you can spin the propeller. But okay. I just, I so have a feeling that. Like. Again, in in theory, and this is my opinion, but in theory, it's you know it's what you're saying is probably true. But I think that the cost versus the gain probably wouldn't make sense. Well, let's face it: if something like that really worked and was going to increase, was going to really improve efficiency, you don't think they would have done it? I don't know. I just was wondering why they never did. It just seems like, <clears throat> I mean, when I was a kid. You know, I had this friend who used to build cars and stuff, and he always wanted to get a boat, put like a 327 with a three-speed transmission in it, and shift it like a car, you know? And I'm like, it sounded great, you know? Yeah. I can't tell you. would think it would work, it, and phys physics-wise, you would think it yeah. would work. But I, I can tell you from experience, because <laughs> you do that believe time. it or not, <laughs> not exactly the same thing, but I have done that. <laughs> it wasn't on anything that went fast. Years ago, there was a bunch of a uh, bunch of my buddies. We had kind of an unofficial river race every year. It was and it was actually completely illegal because we do the Charles River and we do an overnight camping halfway down the river. Um, we used to I don't know how many miles we'd start up in Millis somewhere, and we'd come down the river back to Needham. But uh, and but the whole thing it, it was a homemade raft race. The rafts had to be 100% homemade. They were all powered by something, but you could not. You weren't allowed to use like a trolling motor or an outboard motor. It had to be a homemade. So I had the first year. I actually used. I just used a lawnmower engine, and I put a shaft through with just an in. Basically, I tilted the lawnmower engine at an angle and ran a shaft down with a propeller under it. And that was legal. And well. <laughs> But the, like but I said, the race rules that they had. But our <laughs> rules, it was legal. As far as, I mean, it was a motorized vessel that I clearly was never registered. <laughs> the raft itself was made out of um, water cooler bottles. Right. You know, the five gallon. Yeah. Uh, I made a frame, a, pl a frame out of two by four, sheet, sheet of plywood on the top, and bottles underneath. And, you know, each year there'd be improvements on it. And the first year, I actually had constant problems with the engine overheating because it was working so hard, and it was also that it was at an angle, so it wasn't getting lubricated properly. I was just thinking that. I'm so glad I that. <laughs> so the second year, it should have an external reservoir, right? Yeah. That sounds like a V drive. Uh, well, the second year, I took a Build front a constant meter. velocity joint out of a Honda Civic. <laughs> And welded it to the engine shaft and my propeller shaft so I could mount the engine flat and angle that. Or, it was better. Or, or you could do that. Yeah. So, Why didn't I do now that? getting to your original question, the third year I took a transmission out of a Triumph Spitfire, a little tiny car, and put a four speed with reverse in my raft. Oh my God. And? and? Did you put the clutch into? No. <laughs> um, we don't need no clutch. And A, the, uh, it really didn't work that much better 
yeah. as far as the top speed, but part of it was the hull speed of my concoction was very limiting. But um, it didn't make a big difference, and I managed to blow the transmission three quarters of the way through the race, so, which doesn't speak very highly for a Triumph transmission when a three and a half horse long lawnmower lawn engine, engine was more than it could handle. <laughs> I would think too that the difference between a boat and a car is, in a car, once you get up to speed, you actually have a lot more, a lot more momentum, so you can shift to a higher gear in a boat because of the resistance. Drag, yeah. yeah, you have so much drag. Well, but that's essentially say, the principle of that of that Mercury outboard is it has a two-speed, yeah. almost so like an, auto, like an you automatic have a transmission. Huge amount of horsepower. I could see Yo, that yeah. you might be able to do something. Like that. Yeah, it's a 600 But horsepower. the point is, you've oh. already got, and if you think back to the early automotive transmission, the automatic transmissions were a fluid drive. Well, that's basically what a boat is anyway. But um, but if you think of, you know, you talk about it, but if you think of an auto, try driving an automobile in soft sand, mm -hmm. and you'll see what, especially if you have a manual transmission. By the time you go to shift from first to second, you slow down so fast you got to go back to first again. You know. So with the vertical um, outboard, the question I have is, I have a little Honda five horsepower that's on an inflatable, and then I've got a a skiff that I've got a twenty five horsepower motor on. <coughs> Does the water automatically drain out of those when the motors down yeah if it's not in the water if it's not in the water like I noticed in the diagram on um, 66 it almost looked like there's a little bit of a dip at the top and I just wonder does all the water drain out or does it sit there like this sounds you probably laugh but my my five horsepower Honda I never do anything to it yeah I just take it off the back of the inflatable, bring it home and stick it in my basement in the winter. And it starts up in the spring and it, I've had the yeah, ammo it just but, works. Yeah. It's because it's a Honda. But the, <laughs> the Yamaha, you know, that I run um, non-toxic antifreeze through every year. Uh, yeah, generally outboards are self-draining. And I'm saying generally because again, you refer to the owner's manual, but as a general rule, I mean, like you, I've had I've got a 1957 18 horse Johnson that I've had for, uh, probably since I was 12 or 14 years old. Um, and exactly like you said, I never do a thing to it. I, I run it in the summer. I usually bring it home, stick it in the trash barrel of fresh water, run it to get the salt out of it, and stick it. Well, it used to be in my parents' garage, now it's in my barn leave it there until the next time I want to use it, which might be the next season, or it might be seven or eight years. Yeah. And every time, if it doesn't start on the second or third pole, there's something wrong with it. It's... Do you leave the gas in it? Uh, well, it's a, I mean, it's a separate tank. I drain the tank. And the other thing I do on all of my outboards is at the end of, literally the end of the day, unless I'm absolutely going to be using it the next day, is I disconnect the tank and run the engine dry of fuel. And I do that every time I leave the boat. Huh. Um, and partially I do it, if you know you're gonna run it the next day, you don't necessarily have to do that. But with me, I never know if I'm gonna use it the next day or I may not use it again that season. Hmm. But, and again, it's probably unnecessary. It's something my dad always did when I was a kid and I've just always done it and it has saved me from having fuel issues. Because literally, I, I pull the line off, start the engine and run it, and when it starts to sputter, I'll actually pull the choke on to get every last bit of fuel out of it. Hmm. And I find, I mean, it seemed, it's, it's worked for me for years with the old stuff. And I do that, you know, I do that on all of my, all of my outboards. I mean, the newest one I have is a, I think it's a 90, mid 90s Mercury uh, 45 horse that I do that. I do the same thing with that. So if an outboard is up, does the water still drain out of it? 
most of it. You'll get a little bit trapped in the with the like in the exhaust housing. Yeah. So you usually I, I usually recommend storing them in down. And if not, at least put it down to drain it. And then like if you have to trailer it, I know some people get them shrink wrapped on the trailer and you have to trailer it. Uh, then I recommend you know put it down, make sure it's completely drained, then you can raise it up. But I usually suggest that whoever shrink wraps it have them go right over the prop and everything so you don't get water in there over the winter. Yeah, um, it's usually open enough. I have not really seen problems because of water freezing just down in that little in the lower unit. But again, I just as a general principle, I usually try to keep, make sure everything's drained. Mm -hmm. And again, I, these are, I'm talking older stuff. I don't know about the real new, particularly these big engines. But like this, this diagram you were referring to is a little misleading. It's, it's not just a single passage. The water jackets surround the engine. Mm -hmm. And they're normally designed so that the water will drain out Okay. Yeah. So if your outboard was still on the boat and it's, you leave your boat in the water through late October, November, do you recommend that the outboard engine be down in the water? In case of freezing? Um, I've never really never thought that much about it, but um, again, I suppose that would depend on where your, you know, where your boat is, and you know, as a general rule, I like to get if you, if your outboard will pull the lower unit out, if you whether it's a stern drive or an outboard, if you can get that lower unit out of the water, you're a lot less likely to end up with water in the lower unit go through the seals. Mm -hmm. Too. Yeah. No, but you do get those cold snaps late in the fall. Yeah. And that's but I'll leave the skip in the water till the very last second when yeah. I know the water's so cold I don't want to go in it anymore. Yeah. The only thing is also if it's that close to the water, you're gonna get heat coming off the wall. I don't I think it's unlikely you're gonna you know, unless you're a real die hard it's unlikely you're going to have it in the water long enough to freeze it up solid yeah but i mean i suppose if you are in those extreme conditions where it's a concern leave it down you know mm. um, or buy a new boat if it happens <laughs> yeah. i'll take donations on that Jim. Um, all right, so that kind of gives it, that's kind of the rundown on the outboard. Um, and basically, the next thing just got the stern drive or inboard outboard, as we're going to call it. Um, the lower unit is pretty much the same, th it's pretty much the same thing as the uh, outboard. Um, it's just the engines in the boat and through a series of universal joints and gears um, we're uh, providing power to that lower unit. Mm -hmm. The you know the downside to a stern drive versus an outboard is there's a lot of complexity in order to make all that happen. Um, in the upper case on the steering drive, where you yeah. get the output shaft from the engine, yeah. but then it has to get transferred yeah. vertically. It's, is it just like beveled gears, yes, essentially? There's, yeah, there's, and there's different, it's basically like an automobile rear end. It's a ring and pinion gear. And yeah. there are different gear ratios in stern drives depending on the engine and boat size. Hmm. Uh, okay. There's 1.5 to 1, 1.6 to 1. You know, if you have a Merc Cruiser, a small, you know, like a 120 small horse, those often will be a 
six to one. Um, mm -hmm. Now let me get this straight. A one point five to one versus if you have a you know you've got a big block four fifty four five hundred cubic inch V eight. There'll often be a that would be a one point six to one numerical. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, the ju again, just like in an automobile, the higher numerical ratio is going to give the engine a little more advantage at the cost of some top speed. Right. But if you don't have the horsepower to s spin the propeller, then the top speed is going to be compromised anyway. Right, right. So the bigger motor will be but the, strong. The point be is, you can the, you can at the low end. The yeah, well, the bigger motor will have more. Yeah, the engine's yeah. stronger at the low end. Yeah. yeah. So, so basically, changing the gear level. ratio is it is essentially the same thing that happens when you change the pitch of the propeller. Okay. Um, but the point I'm just making, you could have two identical looking Alpha 1 stern drives that are not the same. Because oh. <coughs> that's actually one of the things I did when I put the, you know, I said I put a Chevy V8 into my 19 foot Cuddy, uh, which originally was a four cylinder. I actually changed the gears in the upper, upper gear case of the lower unit. Did you take that off the wraps? <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot more engine than boat. <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of Tim Allen in here. All right, and then we also have tilt and trim systems. Uh, and as you picked up on the home work, that, uh, one nice thing with power trim, whether it's an outboard or a stern drive, is the back effect, ability to compensate for loading of the boat by trimming the, trimming the bow up or down. Um, <clears throat> As far as maintenance um, on either a stern drive or lower unit, now in the course here, they basically they should be checked and serviced at least twice during the boating season. Out of curiosity, how many of you folks haul your boats out to service the lower unit in the middle of the season? <laughs> I have yet to have anybody tell me they did. Yeah. But is that designed for boats in the water year round? Like in Florida? Or uh, like they that? don't really specify. But, but that's a good point. Because you only have two months in a season. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> much point to but basically, my suggestion is to, you know, is to pay attention at the end of the season when you drain the oil. And if everything looks good, if there's no moisture in it, no metal in it. Again, as you point out, in New England, you you should be good for the seed for the next season. Yeah. Um, but for the purposes of this exam, this course, it's twice a season. Yeah. That's like one of the earlier chapters said that you should check your props every time you use the boat. That's right. <laughs> you should. I can't see ours. <laughs> Well, that's what you have to hire a diver for. We tried snorkeling. So long as the, pro so long as the props the are still so on the boat, thick. Yeah. Works for me. Um, in the armory, and you probably run the risk of getting electrical shock if you get one in But we did it when we went out to the harbor, but yeah. Right. Um, the visibility is not that good. Now, when you're as far as servicing these lower units, um, you want to, when you go to drain the, um, before you drain all the fluid out, 
is if you take, before you take the top plug out, there's, there's a vent plug on top and a drain plug on the bottom. If you crack the drain plug and initially see what comes out, that's if you have any water, that's when you're going to see it because it's going to set the water and the oil will separate. Particularly if the boat's out, if you haven't run it recently. Um, so the oil floats on top of the water. Mm -hmm. so the, yeah. oil, the water is going to go to the bottom. Yeah, water is heavier than oil, so the water mm -hmm. will go to the bottom. Because as I said, what I, you know, I think I mentioned, I had one of my the boat that we use up at camp all the time. The seals have been junk in the lower unit for years. And I get in the habit of every single weekend, because I pull the boat out every weekend. It's just a little 14 foot boat. Um, before I put it in, I open the I just open the, uh, crack the bottom drain plug and drain all the water out. And then when oil stops, when the water stops and oil starts coming, I shut the drain plug and then just fill it up again with the rest with oil. Um, that's not recommended procedure, but that's what you do. The seals were gone, and every single time I used, literally in one day, I'd end up with a quarter of a cup of water in the lower unit. I think that was actually one of the answers on the the homework. That was not the correct answer. <laughs> was, was was drain the water out and add more oil at the top? <laughs> yeah. Well, like I said, that's not recommended. But yeah. Well, actually, I should rephrase that. You don't add the oil at the top. The way you have to fill those is you take the bottom plug out and like in my case use it, I've got a quart of oil with the with the um, pointy pointed top. You put that in the hole with the with the top plug out and you squeeze oil in until it comes out the top plug. Then you tighten the top plug which creates a vacuum so you can pull the bottle out and put the bottom plug in. If you try to fill it from the top a, it will take you a month of Sundays to do it, and B, it may not even be completely full. So you always want to fill them from the bottom up. courses you know we teach what's supposed to happen then I try to elaborate on what happens in the real world you know which are often two very different things how often should the low unit oil be replaced by the course or by <laughs> reality I'll take reality first uh, reality is I suggested every season um, by the purposes of its course, it's twice a season. Oh, okay. So in that same, that's what we just talked about. That's what we're talking yeah. about. Then, the twice a season. Okay. Yeah. Um, and again, or in my case, every okay. weekend. Yeah. yeah. Well, hopefully, I actually resealed that lower unit a month ago. So hopefully, that I'll be through, done with that. Now I can go to once a season. having a car that burns enough oil you, you never have to do an oil change you yeah self-changing oil <laughs> you just keep adding you laugh we have a truck at babson that <laughs> once a year i screw a new filter on it and they they add oil about once every other week um i had a chevy vega every time you filled it up with gas put a quart of oil in it <laughs> Yeah. Well, you were doing well then. If you got a whole tank of gas before you had to put oil in. <laughs> I had five or six Vegas when I was in college, yeah. and I, I used to run them on. I got got to find I was run, or I was ordering seventy weight racing oil. Oh, so it wouldn't get by the rinse. <laughs> so that it would slow down the oil consumption. I tried running ninety weight gear oil, but they wouldn't start. So that didn't, that didn't work. <laughs> It's called trial and error. But, well, those that was the Seven error. Those cars were free, literally people gave get them out of my backyard. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I had a I, GT that I loved 
people, I actually, I like the cars. Yeah. Yeah. People used to give me a hard time. I used mm -hmm. to try to explain to them, they're really not a bad car. Mm -hmm. They've got a couple of shortcomings. Yeah. The brakes are horrible, the engines are junk, yeah. they rust everywhere, the front ends are no good. But other than that. Um, but yeah, aside from that. Everything else. <laughs> By the time they got to the Cosworth, they were actually good cars. Yeah, it was too late. They had a bad reputation. Yeah, yeah. Well, I had one that I, I had one that I got. I put a Buick V6 in it. Yeah. Um, I had somebody had junked a, an old Skylark or something, yeah. and I took the V6 engine and transmission out of the Buick and put it in the Vega. Oh, that must have been awesome. Yeah. And uh, yeah, except I kept blowing the rear ends up. <laughs> Uh, back to um, yeah, I, I was always famous for making something out of what was kicking around. That's talent. Um, the problem is, I'm in my 60s now, and I'm still doing the same thing. I just finished marrying several snowmobiles to make one. And there's and, nothing wrong with that. And it actually performed flawlessly all weekend. We put cool. about 200 miles on it this weekend, and it was literally cobbled together from three dead ones. <laughs> That's cool. That's it's a sense of an accomplishment. Yeah. 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 It, actually, the trails are pretty decent. It was where we go. We, we go up a ways. Yeah. It wasn't a lot of snow, but it was groomed and what they had. I think part of a lot of people aren't, it's just they're not heavily traveled because everybody assumes there's no snow. Right. Mm. Uh, it's kept secret. All right, we'll get into chapter eight. Um, controls, instruments, and alarms. Um, primary controls are steering gear, throttle, and transmission shift levers. The most basic engine control was, and I haven't even seen one of these in any recent memory, was the, the rod and lever, which I think maybe on some of the old, uh, yeah, uh, um, like launch service boats where you know, literally the throttle was a lever here with a rod hooked to it that went to the engine. Oh, and literally yeah. throttle controls was that was it. That's that's the simplest. My father had a fifty seven Chris craft like that. Yeah. Um, you know, nowadays the most common for pleasure boats anyway is um, cable, yeah. cable actuated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the launch in Hewitt's Cove and Hingham was like that. It had this big vertical, it looked like an oar. Yeah. And it went yeah. forward and backwards. Yeah, and I wonder if any yeah. of those are actually still a rod. Uh, some of that may just be it, statics it, and it may be a cable. A cable, underneath. yeah. yeah. But, but yeah. I still look challenging. Yeah, but you know, I'm talking the old yeah, days where you had an, the inboard engine sitting in the middle of the boat, and the controls were on the box that was covering the engines. And it conceivably was just a rod going to the. Yeah. Um, hey, uh, in instruments. Before we get there, can I ask a question? Yeah. I have one of these two lever throttle and shift. Yeah. And the throttle at low RPMs, you know, you're moving forward. If you let go of the throttle, it actually goes back down again. Is yeah. that adjustable? It depends and on the control. Most of them, yes. There's normally a friction screw inside here. In, yeah, in the binnacle. Or in okay. The, but again, it depends on the manufacturer. Yeah. But <laughs> um, what do you not have one? But other than that, uh, you know, a pair of vice grips on there can. Is that what the guy driving the train did? Yeah. He crashed. I actually jam a sponge in there. 
If there's no adjust, if, if there's no, I mean, there's there should be an adjustment of some sort, but if they get it, it's but normally the you know that friction adjust is usually in the in the control itself. So, was there a rationale in going from controls like that in '72? Because, like, we have we have two sets like that, so we have yeah. two. We have two shift levers and two throttles. Yeah. Was there a rationale from going to that to like the newer boats to just have an integrated? Just ease of operation. You know, okay. It's because again, I had for years I always had the two levers even on the on the small outboards. And when I first time I got a boat that had a single lever control, I thought that was the greatest thing since sliced bread. It was just it much more intuitive. Um, I mean, like anything else, though, the downside is that you can't put, with the two lever controls, particularly if you've got an engine that's not running quite right, you can keep your throttle up a little more as you're shifting to keep it from stalling. Oh, Where, with the separate controls. With the separate controls. Yeah. Whereas with the... Yeah, except you beat up the transmission. Well, I'm saying if it's not, oh, if right. it's idling too low. Oh, you can, idling too low. You can right, correct right. for it. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, but unfortunately, exactly your point. My, the second part of my safe is going to be you can also do damage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I did that a few times. Um, all right. Yeah, uh, most most recreational boat instruments are 12 volt electric gauges, um, obviously supplied from the batteries, versus like in a lot of automotive applications, you'll find their mechanical gauges. You'll actually have an oil pressure gauge which will have a tube from the engine to the gauge. It actually reads, it reads the actual oil pressure versus an electric gauge which has a sending unit and it just has electrical wire, just a wire up to the gauge. Um, temperature gauge the same way. And basically, that's the mechanical gauges actually tend to be a little more accurate. Uh, however, the logistics in a boat would be a lot of, you know, there tends to be more distance. In an automobile, you've got the engine here and the dashboard here. So. And the other issue is with the mechanical gauge, if you have either a failure of the gauge or that line chafes or breaks, you're going to end up with oil getting sprayed at 90. You know, 60 to 90 psi coming out of it. Um, and so, con consequently, the you know gauges, the instruments are of no value without sensors or transmitters, and that's because it's an electric. Mm -hmm. Sorry, can I go back to one more question about the the integrated throttle shift? Yeah. How does that work in a boat that has multiple helm positions? Like you have an inner helm and then you have like a flybridge. You, How, switch, you transfer it. There's a procedure where you transfer the control like, to the inner helm. Oh, okay. okay. So if that guy goes yeah. flying off, then either, no place, either place you can actually transfer it but you have to put it in neutral there's a button on the that's newer boats mine is, mine is just all mechanical so, so they're both it's behind. operating both at the same yeah time. i was going to say the, the, the older ones, ones were just you know, you know you could be um, watching at the lower helm and as you're as you're pushing the upper helm the yeah. lower ones moving right they that's just link together so oh that's what your boat traditionally <laughs> so they're actually linked oh, oh okay Um, now on a tachometer, how do you, how, how can you test the accuracy of that? Um, 
and then well, you can get a handheld. I mean, you can use a handheld. Yeah, but there it's are not, it's, it's not gonna connect direct to reading tachometers that you can put right on the work. right on the like on the what's accessible, but say the front the front damper of the engine or the flywheel. I mean, depending on the type of installation. Mm -hmm. But you would attach but there the is a direct thing. reading. Uh, the other option is to get a handheld yeah. diagnostic tack that hooks to the ignition coil. Yeah. Yeah, Jim, I, I think he's talking about an optical one. Yes, I am. Yeah. Is that what a mechanic would do to... Because uh, I, I have a situation where the upper helm is, uh, is 100 RPM different than the lower helm. Yeah. So one of them is wrong. Well, yeah. maybe they're both wrong, and they have to be adjusted. So is it adjustable? Is it something that you can adjust? Generally not. Okay. Um, some of them are select. You know, some of the aftermarket tachometers are selectable for four, six, or eight cylinders, but the, uh, nothing in recent me memory is adjustable. I know years ago they'd be a little through the window of the tack. They'd be a little screw that you could adjust it, but that's something I haven't seen in a very long time. The, yeah, probably the best and easiest way is, you know, most mechanics are going to have a handheld dwell tack that, just so you know, if it's a gas engine, it just hooks to the ignition coil and ground, and they can... It's got a big diesel. Oh, oh, and... The, Where would it be attached to on a diesel? Uh, diesel wouldn't have you. That, you would have to use, like, an optical... Yeah. All right, the two, two most relatively critical gauges are oil pressure and temperature gauge. Um, those are the ones that are, you know, you kind of, you're going to want to monitor. And, I mean, theoretically, you should be doing a quick, quick glance across them pretty regularly. Um, and either, and again, you know, as I, I mentioned before, you're not looking so much for a specific pressure or temperature. You're looking for what's normal for your boat and if something changes. Because as I mentioned, these, these gauges are not super accurate. Mm -hmm. So it, as I said, it's more more a matter of you get to know your boat normally run, you know, it might run at 160 degrees, it might run at 190 degrees, some of it might run at 200 degrees, and the gauges can be off by 20, 30 degrees. It's not uncommon. So it's more a matter of just knowing what it normally runs at, and if something changes, to, that's when you need to start looking for why did it change. But those two, temperature and oil pressure, will will lead to damage and costly repairs. Um, oil pressure being, if you have a sudden sudden loss of oil pressure, that's a stop the engine immediately and look into it. Uh, temperature. I mean, you don't want to let it pin itself in the overheat, but you can. Um, yeah, temperature generally climbs at a slower rate. Um, you know, if you have an issue like a plugged C strainer or a water pump starting to fail, if you're watching your gauges regularly, generally you're going to see a pattern where you're going to start seeing, geez, it's running a little warmer than it used to, and the next time it's a little warmer than that. Or if you're on a long run, you're going to see it higher and gradually higher and if you're watching it hopefully you can get into you know get into port or get yourself out of harm's way before you have to shut it down but if it does if the temperature gauge does start to spike and get up into the red at that point you're better off to drop the hook and let it sit and let it cool off a bit 
you know, the nice thing, unlike oil pressure, with temperature, if you let it cool off, you generally can start it and run it for a short period of time watching that gauge. So you literally can leapfrog your way back if you have to. Gauges, the other gauge is fuel level gauge, which obviously you want to monitor. But you, and, and I think I said this before, even more so than oil and temperature, fuel level gauges are notoriously inaccurate. Um, that again is where you, you kind of get to know your boat. Um, you know, my my recommendation is I basically never let mine go, I never let mine get below half. The same thing I do, really the same thing I do with my trucks and cars. I usually try to stay in the, st the top half of the tank. Um, I do understand if you've got a large tank, you know, if you've got 200 gallons of fuel, you may not always want to be hauling that kind of weight around. Um, but you have to weigh that versus the condensation issues, I mean, a partial tank of fuel is more prone to condensation. Um, but, the, you know, the big thing to me, I just, I like keeping the tanks full or above half all the time because you never know when you're going to go down and the, you know, the marina's either out of fuel or there's some issue. If you always keep the tank, uh, if you always keep the thing over half a tank, then well, it doesn't ruin your day. You know, right. you can still go out. Yeah. Or if you like Steve, you just add fuel once a season, whether it needs it or not. Yeah, about, about every third season. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> whether it needs it or not. Whether it needs it or not. Yeah. Um, all right. Did you? We started talking. About Obviously, tachometers are engine measure engine speed. Uh, <clears throat> uh, use again. Use main the main purpose of attack. You know, well, A is matching for matching propellers, and, but again, it's also something you're paying attention to. If all of a sudden you can't reach rated RPM or you can't reach the RPM that always used to again that's <coughs> telling you so, you know this we need to look into this what's wrong it could be as simple as a chip on the prop or you could have major internal issues or the other possibility if it's your RPM is running a little higher than it should you could be starting to spin a hub and a propeller or a hub, or the coupler and the from the engine to the drive if it's a stern drive uh, but these are all little telltales that oftentimes you can pick up on before you're stranded. Um, and the next thing would be, well, uh, speed speed indicators or a speedometer. Um, generally, the speed indicator or the speedometer in the boats generally is indicating the speed over speed through the water, not necessarily speed over ground. Um, you know, depending on what you've got for electronics, you may or may not have a speed over ground. But the ones that we're talking about that are in the boat are generally sp speed through the water. And basically all they are is a pressure gauge. They have what's referred to as a pitot tube. It's a basically a little hook with a tube, open end of the tube facing to into the flow of water just below the hull. And it builds, the faster you go, the harder the water is forced into that tube. And the gauge at the other end is just reading water pressure. So again, get popped up over time, I bet. Hmm? 
I'm sure that can get clogged over time. Yeah, they can get clogged over a day. You know, that's. Um, but again, just do obviously accuracy is not not a strong point. Um, then we have charging system indicators, which. Um, traditionally were amp, amp meters and basically what an amp meter is doing is measuring flow of electricity either into or out of your battery so on a on, on a boat with an amp meter normally when you first start the engine you will see a fairly high charge rate um, you know you'll see your amp me amp gauge will move to the charge side a fair amount and because the alternator or generator is working harder to replenish the pop the energy you use to start the engine because a starter motor draws a lot of current and as it runs you'll see an amp meter assuming that you don't have anything else any other excessive draws on the system, as the battery recharges, the amp meter will generally drop back toward zero. Um, an amp meter sitting pretty close to zero is not necessarily indicating a problem. It just means you're not requiring much energy out of that battery. Um, now, if you have a inverter or refrigerator and you, the engine's running at low RPM, then you very well may see that amp meter go to discharge when the refrigerator comes on. Um, again, if everything's working properly, bringing the RPM up should offset that. You should see the gauge come up. I myself actually prefer a voltmeter to an amp meter because a voltmeter gives you a, it to me it gives you a better idea of what's going on in the electrical system um, because it, the a voltmeter is telling all it's telling you is the voltage um, voltage at the battery or at the engine and regardless of whether how hard the is working <coughs> a, a voltmeter should be relatively steady I mean, again, when you first started, it might be a little bit lower until it recharges the battery. But I find voltmeters are much, uh, much more intuitive to look at. You know, you look at a voltmeter; it normally is going to be around 14 volts. Um, you know, I mean, good. If it drops below 12, 12 and a half, you know, there's a problem. Do any of these meters, I mean, does age have an effect on that all, or because mine are like 40 years yeah, old? No, unfortunately, age things. has an effect on all of us. <laughs> as long as we keep working, <laughs> <laughs> it seems like these things just work. <laughs> That's because they're 40 years old. Yeah. I can pretty much guarantee you, ones that were made in 1922, 40 years from now, are not going to be working. Okay. As far as I'm concerned, if they're working properly, keep them. I, I, that's one thing. I, I, the quality of of uh, replacement parts now. You know, I'm a big prepare. I I restored an old Volkswagen Dune buggy, and I made it a point to change to chase down good used original parts rather than buying stuff after you know replacement, okay. just because of the quality. But again, if they're working good, I would. Uh, I would stick with the old stuff. Yeah. Jim's got all the analog meters, dials and pointers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's simple. And it works. And it works. I mean, you give up some precision, but that's about it. I'm good. For the record, I've got analog meters in my boat, too. So. Um, well, the other thing, in, in all honesty, the other, the other thing I prefer analog 
from the standpoint that at a quick glance, you get again, you get to know your boat, you know where everything should be sitting. I don't think it's in, it's quite, it, you don't pick up a digital readout. I know I may not pick up as quickly. At a quick glance, I can tell you this gauge is here, this one's here, this one's here, that's normal. I don't have to think, it's just a quick glance. Whereas with an analog gauge, you have to analyze the numbers. With a digital gauge. I mean, yeah, sorry, with a digital gauge. Um, uh, and the other thing, if you know, if you really want to be, if you really want to be crazy about it, um, it's like the guys do with the race cars, is you take your analog gauges and turn them so that when you're under normal operating conditions, all the air, all the needles are pointing straight up. So they, you don't even have to think. At a quick glance, yep, they're all straight up. We're good. Uh oh, oh, so, you so the gauge is the gauge. Yeah, yeah you literally turn the gauge so that at cruising idea. RPM, everything yeah. is in a is straight up. I like that. And that way you don't have to think. I mean, it looks a little odd other when you're not cruising. <laughs> <laughs> Good idea. Um, I just might do that. Just the other thing I am a big believer in is adding idiot lights or indicator lights or warning horn, you know, depending on the, the situation. Especially in oil pressure, the, I would imagine, right? Oil pressure, temperature, basically those two, oil pressure and temperature are the two main ones that um, you know the problem. The only problem with the light is in you know in a boat. If it's a bright sunny day, you may or may not see a warning light. Um, a warning horn, which is what a lot of manufacturers use now, um, something that will call your attention to look at the gauges. And even the manu auto manufacturers are finally starting to catch on to that. Most of the new cars have a check gauges light that comes along. And oftentimes it's with a chime or something that, and people still ignore them and seize engines. But. <laughs> yeah, we've got a little panel next to the helm, and it's got lights and buzzers. Yeah. For that's all those various things. They were cold boats. It's really small inside. Mm. And the gauges are all buzzers. Um, but when that thing starts wailing, like we overheated. One of the end. I mean, it's like <laughs> there's no ignoring it. <laughs> yeah, well, you really shouldn't be ignoring it. So. Um, what else would you glue an impeller? And then well, basically, you didn't blow an impeller, you yeah. failed to change it preemptively. Exactly. Um, the next thing is an hour meter. Obviously, it measures the total number of hours on the engine. How many hours on a 40 year old boat? Hmm? How many hours on a 40 year old boat? 3,900. <laughs> if it's accurate. And that's. It's yeah, hour meters, it years, hour meters hours. are generally <laughs> relatively accurate. Um, but the main thing the hour meter helps you with is maintenance, being able to keep track of. Now, is there a general rule of when when it's either legal or appropriate to set that back to zero, like if you've had some sort of engine overhaul of some sort? Um, as far as an hour meter goes, I mean, I wouldn't swear to it, but I don't think there's legal issues. I mean, if you've replaced an engine, I would probably... Yeah, you want to zero it out. Zero it. Um, I know, and like in my boat, when I, I, re I repowered, I put a brand new engine, cooling, so everything, and I put... Well, mine didn't have an hour meter prior to that. I put one in and right. started at zero. But hour meters, as far as I know, it's not regulated like a speedometer in a car where you... Um, the only thing I would say, setting it back to zero may affect as far as if you're selling the boat, now it's unknown. You know, right. now your true hours are not actually known, which may be more detrimental than having high hours on it. So, as a general rule, I wouldn't rec wouldn't recommend intentionally resetting it. If it dies and you have to replace it, then you're going to be back to zero. But I 
I've seen ads where it would say, you know, 2,500 hours on engines rebuilt at 1,500 or something. So you know approximately how much, how long the whole boat has been used, but then they have, you know, this is when you the know, engines it's, were rebuilt. It's similar to like in an automobile. I get people from my shop all the time. I'd, re, I'd install a rebuilt engine and I had people, well, do you set the odometer back to zero? Right. I'm like, no, because the rest of the vehicle still has that many miles on it. 100,000 miles on it. I looked at a boat that I didn't buy, but I looked at a boat that had 11,000 hours on a diesel engine. And uh, however, the guy at 6,000 or 8,000 miles or something like that had it rebuilt, but only from the top. It wasn't a complete rebuild. It was yeah, like they probably had a top end. Uh, the top end? Yeah. And then the, uh, the surveyor said, told the guy, you know, he probably had justification to roll that back. And, uh, he, but he didn't believe in doing it for the same reason you just gave Yeah. Him. The boat has been used, but that's not a bad thing. Yeah. yeah. I didn't buy it. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. my experience about buying boats or cars or really any piece of equipment. I'd rather find something that's got more hours or more miles on it that everything just is right. Nothing's been messed around with. You know, I'd rather buy a car that's got 120,000 miles on it that's pretty much here it is. We've put brakes in it. We've just done normal maintenance over the years versus one with 60,000 that's got the engine's been rebuilt, the transmission's been replaced. It's, because immediately, I'm like, okay, this has been a troublesome vehicle from the get-go. Do I really want to get involved with it? Yeah. And for some, you can get into too few hours. Like, our generator only has 300 and something hours on it. It's 22 years old, and it runs like hell. We're going to end up probably going, going through the whole thing this season, mm -hmm. just because it didn't get exercised enough. All right. Um... Then the other thing that I think we touched on the other day was a rudder position indicator, which I'm a big purveyor of. I actually find it very handy to know when you're when you're first putting the first putting that boat into gear, having an idea which way it's going to go. <laughs> so, very handy. That was a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> and like I said, I mean you don't even have to get extravagant. You you can go down to West Marine and for. 10 box buy a little thing that sticks on the center of the steering wheel. You center the rudder or drives, whatever you have. You center the this little, basically just by turning it, you center the little gauge and it's a just, you peel off the back and stick it to the steering wheel and they work very well. The only issue I've had on a really hot day if the cabin's closed up, the adhesive lets go and you find it down in the <laughs> down in the corner somewhere. I was gonna say take a take a ten cent piece of tape and just put it around the steering wheel at the top of the wheel, right? It essentially do, do the same I, thing. I actually yeah, the, I, I actually did something around. similar to that. I, I actually spin the wheel and, and bring it yeah, back. The so problem is usually you have more than one rotation of the wheel. Yeah. Right. But then wouldn't that gauge Thing that you stick on the we on the wheel suffer the same thing. No, if you're, if you're no, that that actually has a is like it's got a built-in gearbox, so you can turn the wheel like three times. Oh, and okay, you know, and it uh, that will still when you turn the wheel one revolution, that gauge only moves that much. Oh, okay. Hmm. Have you ever turned the wheel that much? I don't know. Yeah. I'm not sure how far ours are, like lock to lock. That's good to know. Mm. Um, all right, and then, then also we also have a trim tab position indicator. I haven't talked much about that, but um, I don't know how many of you have tabs, but. Um, you know, it's not a bad the if you having an indicator is kind of handy. I mean, it's not crucial, but um, you know, especially if you have a smaller, smaller, lighter boat, tabs make a big difference. Um, 
I know I used to get my wife irritated with our 28 foot or eight tabs on that. And, um, yeah, I remember one day, well, so when we first had it, my wife said, what do the tabs do? Well, we're out, you know, we're out of the river, we're out in Marshfield, out in the open water, you know, cruising along at the time of probably 20 knots. And I said, I'll show you. So I hit one of the tabs because the boat goes, yeah. <laughs> and then I flipped it the other way because my wife's having a fit. I was like, well, you asked. But it does help, you know, if the, depending on how the boat's loaded, you can level it out. Um, but they are, um, some boats have indicators for where the tabs are at. Um, is, so I always thought of it as a bow, like we don't. a bow down. Uh, uh, it does. Well, basically what... Not, not this. I always thought it was just this. Turns the bow down at both Well, you've got the left, yeah, if you put really both there. Yeah. So then no, sometimes I have to literally just turn off the engine and reset them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, you can turn one. Goes if, <laughs> if you've got the boat loaded on, like again, in the smaller yeah, like boat, you've got everybody the sitting on one gauge. side. Yeah. yeah. You can tab or down on that side to level the boat out. out. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Larger, yeah. Larger, larger craft, that's not as much of an issue. Yeah, it's less of an issue in ours. But it's just not worth But the other thing that the tabs will do is get you, it can help you get on plane earlier. Right. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. So this is why I think Big Brother is watching us. I just picked up my phone and went to Google and I typed in rudder and it came up rudder position indicator. Well, Big Brother is listening. Yeah. yeah. Watching, listening. Um, this is spooky. I was going to say, we better check this. Uh, all right. kids. The next thing is <laughs> engine synchronizers. Um, if you have multi <coughs> multi engines, or you probably have it. Mm -hmm. um, if you have with twin engines, if you if you don't have them properly synchronized, or you know both working approximately the same amount, uh, it can set up vibrations. Um, it's also not as efficient, and you're working one engine harder than the other. So normally, a you know engine synchronizer will allow you to adjust your throttles so that both engines are doing the same uh, same amount of work, running at roughly the same RPM. So this right here, it would be normal if the if the indicator was straight up and down. Right yeah, in the that's what that's right. yeah, I believe that's where you want it, right in the middle. Okay. Um, we don't have it. Yeah, we do. It's right in the center in between the two tanks. Just like in the picture. Just like in the picture. Mm -hmm. And you just... Uh, I just look at them both to make sure they're... You just... Yeah. And again... They I have mean, it so slightly, just twist yeah. the two throttle levels and you can see it. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it, it's pretty if sensitive. you don't have a synchronizer, you can do that with tachometers. Yeah. But the synchronizer is a little, it's an easier, a little more accurate way of doing that. He has a thing on his phone, vessel view, and it tells you what the RPMs are. So I just make sure that they're close. Yeah. Yeah. But I didn't know there was a little well, on stuff, your phone. All this stuff is great on your phone until you drop your phone yeah. in the ocean. And uh, then, yeah, you, the then you should know how the gauges work. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, they no, can, I mean, they're all fuzzy. It's, so that's they're all fuzzy. <laughs> some sort of telemetry. <laughs> 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 yeah, there's a module that plugs into the harness on both engines. Wow. Yeah. And yeah. then it's got a Bluetooth. Yeah. And so it's basically I'm just redundant like for the for the um, for the gauges, yeah. but then it has other ones like. Like I have oil pressure and oil temperature, whereas I don't have an oil temperature gauge on the dash. <coughs> is it coming out of the same center unit, or is it different? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Because it's newer, so all those sending units, you know, probably go to some you know, control module or something. So it, it probably does a lot more than I haven't figured out yet. All right.
and we already tired, talked about the visual alarms and so any uh, questions or comments on that? Do you questions for the voters though? Mm -hmm. How do you all keep your stainless nice and bright? Stainless? Tried yet. Is it supposed to be bright? <laughs> <laughs> I get this stuff the other day. I don't know what it's called, but I didn't take rusts. It's not Neverdoll. I have some of that too. I, I didn't stainless. actually buy this for that. I bought it for something else. Yeah, that's right, you super stainless, which was great. You put it on, it's like a gel. And it literally just washes off. It was, everything got bright and clean. And then at the end of the season, it's going bright. It's worse than it did before. So it's yeah, the prism's the old style, it's a polish, elbow grease, yeah. works really well. We never did anything. What's it called, prism? Sure. Prism. No, we didn't. They're not cheap. And then Rusty, no, trailer bearings, how often do you do them? Um, is that a seasonal, or is that a... Yeah. Yeah. I checked start, some you know, prism. I usually prism check them a couple also times. Also I mean, it also depends uh, on how much trailer you do. Uh, I usually check them a couple times during the season, and by checking them, literally, I just jack the wheel off and give it a spin. If it's quiet, it's not loose. As far as I'm good to go. Do you grease it though? Do you grease it? Um, is it a I have. Uh, yeah, I put bearing bodies on them, and normally the routine I do there is I'll tow the boat down to the ramp, and just before I back it into the water. I'll give every each bearing a uh, couple of shots of grease because the idea is you want to pressurize those the bearings because so otherwise what happens is when you back in the water so everything cools off and then it literally the air in there contracts and forms a vacuum and sucks seawater into the bearings. So you like so I like to pump them be right before I back in so they're under pressure to help avoid that. I've had bearing buddies fail twice in the utility trailer. What do you mean you've had them fail? One just, it, just blew up. It just like it just it, it was on, but the whole like basically it's that spring mechanism to push it back as well. It had just let go of all the grease. It was just up and down you just like in the fenders down the license plates just basically bled on all the grease. Yeah, I don't know which style, what style you have. It was quite a uh, bearing buddy. Yeah. And then I had another one that was... Yeah, I was Marine, using was, bearing buddy as a generic term. Yeah. I don't know about particular brands. One was the brand. The yeah. Bearing buddy, and then another one was the, was it Atwood or something like that? I think it was probably through West Marine. But, yeah. And then I just took them off and went back to cats. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And again, if you... You know, if you're not trailering any distance, yeah, it's not as big a deal. But if you're hauling a boat, you know, you're what hauling down the, you're going down the highway, you're doing a 20 or 30 minute ride before you get there, the bearings are going to heat up. Mm -hmm. And that's where it's advantageous. Um, and I've seen a few bearing buddies leak, but I haven't, I haven't really seen too much trouble with them. Mm -hmm. No, no. But that's why I just, but we bought a new utility trailer that's going back and forth to neighbor. Yeah. And that's why I just said so not on a, a utility trailer, it, I wouldn't buy it. I don't know about I'm talking boat trailer. Trailer. Oh I know, but but I mean like on a utility know. trailer you're not you're not dunking it in the water, so right. that, you know, you can pack the barons once in a while, that's about all you need to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. On a utility trailer, what you actually have to watch more is the axles themselves. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> they rust out. Uh, I've had three or four axles break over the years. It's, yeah, usually the trailers are older, but... And my trailer now has got to be 15 years old, but the axle seems good, but the... Yeah, well, the problem is... The very buddies that was having issues with Yeah, I've just, I've had several where the, the axles rot from the inside out. You don't even know they're bad. All of a sudden, you hit a pothole one day, and the, the wheel snaps off. That must get exciting. I've had that happen three or four times. I mean, I had one with my, my utility trailer, but I just I run around town with it. Like I don't mm -hmm. take it long distances. Yeah. Uh, again, also depends what you know. <coughs> if you're the trailers that's happened to me have been larger, like equipment trailers that have been hauled in the winter in the salt. And, so where did you get that? Uh, but I had I actually had one of my boat. In fact, the one I have, my 19 foot 
Wellcraft had a, uh, the trailer. It's a tandem axle trailer, which is a little overkill for that boat. It's because I got the trailer. I got the boat with no trailer, and I got the trailer from someone else. With no boat. But the trailer was ancient. But it was a Galvi trailer. I you know, I went through it. I did all the bearings. I did have about two years. I was. I found where I was, I was taking the boat somewhere. We were headed out, and I got about a mile from my house. Uh, went to make a right turn, and I bang, and one one of the trailer wheels was like that. And I said, "Oh, that's not good." So, well, now then the board it got worse from there. I was like, well, that's all. I got out and took the wheel off, figuring I'll nurse it back to the house. As soon as I went to move, the other one broke. Both axles were rotted. So I reached in the back. I went in the back of my truck and grabbed a um, landscape timber, eight by eight, jacked the trailer up, and dropped it so that the the uh, U-bolts stabbed into the wood, and I towed it back to my house on a skid. Oh, it worked. I got me home. Now, granted, for about six months there was a stripe going down the street <laughs> and my eight by eight was a two by eight by the time i got home but the point is i didn't have to have a tow i got home without any yeah. damage to anything i see a lot of you see a number of boats on trailers I'm gonna put two on the side of the road on the side of the road yeah yeah uh with just, the tires well that actually no, I heard, I heard I have to admit that came from a movie that I saw. I don't know if you've seen The World's Fastest Indian. Yeah. It was a, um, it was a, <coughs> they did he did that with the log and that's where I got the idea, but it actually did work. So for next week, should we do chapter nine? Uh yes. Read and homework. Yeah, I think we're we have two chapters left. Yeah, and I don't. I think the last one is. Emergency yeah. repairs. Yeah. 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 Basis. Just short one. We have two chapters in three weeks. Uh, the third week is the test, I think, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah, actually, we've got. If you want to read nine and ten, because then that following the week. Because yeah, the week before the test, we usually do that. Do a re we go do a review. Oh, okay. Actually, that works for me <coughs> because next week is our last week. Yeah, so you'll actually get, we'll get through all the material. Yeah. Yeah. Then we can watch a video. Mm -hmm. Then we can watch a video. Well, it, it, if it's just a review, then no. mm -hmm. we'll watch okay. it. Yeah. Actually, what was, like, what was I going for the last week? I was going for chapter six last week. Um, probably seven because we, did eight, seven, we yeah. did eight and nine. Yeah, I no, kind of wondering the chapters I, I do like the homework. If I double check my homework. So we have one chapter. Oh, so we just did seven, right? So, 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 so we just did eight. Seven. We finished up seven and then did eight. Uh, yeah, but for so the homework we did. So that's what we did. Seven. 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 The homework with its seven. So, so we want to finish nine so that's and ten. Six. Did you get the next week? Yeah. And yeah. then oh. do the, the homework for all three. Didn't we just do eight, seven nine, and ten? ten? We did eight, seven tonight. Uh, we did seven times? Yeah. yeah. We're, we're, we're homework for seven. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah.